Chapter 18 of The Soul of an Immigrant by Constantine Panuncio. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms toward perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Rabindranath Tagore Chapter 18 My American Philosophy of Life Dear Brother Vincent, in asking me to outline what changes in my thought life I directly attribute to my residence and experience in America, you have asked me a question which has been very much in my mind of late, especially since my recent contact with Italian life and thought. I fear I cannot give you what I know you would want without going somewhat into detail but since you have requested it, I will furnish it to you. I wish you would bear in mind, however, that such changes in my outlook upon life as I am about to describe are in no way typical of what occurs in the mental awakening of the average immigrant in America, be he an Italian or a native of some other country. The fact is, as you know, that mine has been an extraordinary opportunity and privilege to come into contact with the very best people in America, whereas the vast majority of what are here called foreigners remain pretty much segregated, living very much the same life in thought as in other ways as they lived in the countries from which they originally came. If my experience has any significance at all, it lies in the fact that it shows what a transformation in the thought life of the foreign groups could actually take place if in some way or other they had access, as I have had, to the real life of America. Then, too, you will remember, as you read on, that the outlook which we boys had in Italy does not necessarily represent that of the average Italian in Italy. Many young men had greater educational opportunities than we, and for that reason their outlook in our day, or today, may be much broader than ours was. I do think, however, that all in all, my outlook upon life was, in a measure, representative of the thought life of Italy, and especially of that section of Italy in which we were brought up and received our education. Do you not think so? I attribute most of the changes of which I am about to tell you, some of them actual revolutions in fact, to my having come in contact with the best thought life of America, especially during my educational career. It is, of course, conceivable that some of these changes might have taken place had I grown to manhood in Italy, and especially had I gone to the university as originally planned for me but that is a matter of conjecture at best. Moreover, it is quite certain, you will grant me, that with father's death I would no more have gone to the university than you or our other two brothers have. Then, too, I think I have a pretty good criterion that my thought life would not have changed fundamentally had I remained in Italy all these years, in what I gather is your outlook today, and that of our brothers. You have all come in contact with the larger thought life of our native country. At any rate, what I shall here outline for you is what actually has taken place, regardless of any possible changes which might have been effected in my life under favorable circumstances in our loved Italy. All this, you understand, is for the purpose of comparison, and without any derogatory thought in mind toward my old outlook. Now, as to the changes themselves, 
the first of these was the gaining of what i might call a mobile and free attitude toward life in each case i will tell you just how the change occurred when i first came to this country i clearly remember how deeply i was impressed by the adventurous free and easy attitude which people here take toward life now you will grant me that life in our little city as throughout all italy is pretty much static it is a thing seldom heard of for families or parts of families to move from one city or village to another generation after generation live in the same place and it never occurs to them that they might benefit by going to another part of italy to live or even to a nearby town or city our own family for instance has lived in molfetta for many generations like every other person who leaves our native city even father when he went to the university kept looking back to his native city with the idea solidly inculcated in his mind of establishing himself in molfetta it may be of interest to state that in my own experience the one thought which was uppermost in my mind for years after i left home was that however far i might go or however long i might stay some day some fair day i was coming back to molfetta you may recall how father used to repeat to us latin and italian sayings to the effect that the old was always preferable to the new because more sure do you remember this one via trita via tutta the beaten path is the safe path and also chi lascia il vecchio e prende il nuovo sa chi lascia ma non sa chi trova he who leaves the old and takes the new knows what he leaves but does not know what he hath in view now that was exactly the conception which controlled my thinking when i reached america it is true i had taken some decidedly new paths but i had done it in partial defiance unconscious of the old conception but not in obedience to the new conception which displaced the other after i had lived in america several years it is also true that thousands of our people leave italy every year for the utmost parts of the earth but it is not in obedience to a definite attitude toward life but as a matter of necessity and they are always reluctant to leave the old and approach the new and eagerly look forward to the time when they can go back from my very first observations in america i find exactly the contrary to be the case people have no scruples it never occurs to them to have any scruples about leaving one city or one section of the country and establishing themselves in another i am speaking now of representative americans for of course there are exceptions even here they have a proverb which says a rolling stone gathers no moss but the better thought of the country answers who wants to be mossy the mental outlook is one of adventure and free movement i remember how deeply it impressed me to find a family which had for years lived in southern california living in the state of maine on the atlantic coast some three thousand miles away i was also dumbfounded to learn with what ease a young man born in canada and living for several years in maine decided almost in a day to go to live in boston where he has become a lawyer it is not an extraordinary thing to find whole families pick up bag and baggage in an hour as it were and go to live in another part of the country as if it were nothing at all when i first became conscious of this freedom of movement on the part of american people I used to think it was perhaps due to the recklessness of some individuals but the longer i live here the more i feel that it is one of the outstanding characteristics of the people as a whole life for them is a great adventure they do not hesitate to leave the old for the new 
especially if they see in the new an advantage of any kind or degree. It took me five years to recognize in this freedom of movement a possible benefit and to put it to a test in my own life. It was precisely with that end in view that I made the great jump, as I thought in those days, from Maine to Connecticut, a comparatively short distance as distances go here. I had a good opportunity to go to the University of the State of Maine, but I chose to make an experiment by going to college in far off Connecticut. And as the years have passed, I have come to recognize a mobility, a freedom of movement in life as a distinct advantage, and thus the first great change has taken place in my conception of life. I have adopted it as the first plank, I might call it, in my American philosophy of life. My next change was in the matter of my attitude towards the customary. In this connection, do you not recall how carefully we were taught to follow custom? Do you remember how our adult relatives were kept in constant worry and fear that they or we children might overstep in ever so minor a way the bounds of custom? Our lives were circumscribed by the consideration as to whether this little act or that was customary. Father used to say to us, you will recollect, usus loquendi, custom speaks or commands. Whenever he wanted us to do a thing which we did not want to do, or vice versa, that was the most effective way of bringing us to act according to usage and was the most imperative thing he could say. I believe we seldom thought in terms of right or wrong of the deed, but rather the customary or non-customary. Am I not right? This was the second great lesson which I learned in America, to pay attention rather to the right or the wrong of an act than to whether or not it is customary. Now, I would not give you the impression that people here disregard custom, not at all. I find that here the individual is left pretty much to his own judgment, and that his first consideration is not custom so much as whether a thing is right or convenient or advantageous. I think that the first thing that brought to my attention this characteristic of American thought in a striking way was a quotation of three lines from the English poet Tennyson, which I used to hear quoted by public speakers. The old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. With that as a starting point, I came to realize more and more that custom is not altogether an unmigitated good, and that subservience to it, perhaps I should say to it alone, is oftentimes a source of corruption and evil. And as this realization took definite shape in my consciousness, I also recognized it as a distinct characteristic of the American way of looking at things. Not unlike this was the change which took place in my thought life regarding the opinions of others. I do not recall any of Father's teachings on this point, except that he used to say something about consulting an old sailor about the weather. If he ever gave us any instructions in regard to this, it has entirely slipped my mind. Anyway, he himself was so independent and so free from the snare of other people's opinions that he could not have said very much about this. I do not mean to use the idea of consulting as synonymous with regard for the opinions of others. You will see that there is a very clear difference between the two concepts. One refers to a person's seeking the advice of another, whether or not he follows the counsel given. The other has reference to that obnoxious practice so prevalent everywhere of sticking one's nose in another's business, as Americans say, and trying, with or without reason, to impose their opinions upon others. 
the idea of freedom from the opinions of others differs from that of freedom from custom in that the latter is a general force while the former is the definite expression of one person regarding the doings of another now i think you will call to mind how people we knew in our boyhood days were actually slaves to this kind of practice how they were continually worrying over what this or that person had said or might say as a direct result of that early influence i had acquired a habit of doing the same thing in my first few years in america i carried it to such an extreme that I was continually changing my course of action to suit what this man or that man had said. This caused me not a little trouble and has had a more or less detrimental and permanent effect upon my life. Possibly some of it was due to the inexperience of youth, yet I believe it was more deep-seated than that. At any rate, I attribute my present attitude to my contact with America. One of the first sayings I learned in America, and which has had a profound influence upon my thought life, was this. Someone, apparently taking exception with Shakespeare's famous dictum, Conscience makes cowards of us all, remarked, It is not conscience, but cowardice, that makes slaves of us all. That is, it is not our deepest convictions, nor what our inmost selves dictates that makes us cowards but rather our fear of what people will say if we put into action our inmost convictions in powerful lines which i find myself repeating often browning in his paracelsus has expressed indirectly and in a positive sense this same idea truth is within ourselves it takes no rise from outward things whatever you may believe there is an inmost center in us all where truth abides in fullness and to know rather consists in opening out a way whence that imprisoned splendor may escape in quoting these lines i generally substitute the word live for know and thereby i have in concrete form another plank in my american philosophy of life Another striking change which has taken place in my way of looking at life and which is directly due to my residence in America is my conception of real as contrasted with what I might call inherited worth. In this connection, it will doubtless come to your mind, as it does to mine, how deeply we were impressed in our youth with the thought that our ancestors were great people and the thought was often implied, if not expressed, that their greatness was enough to make us great, or at least to give us an honorable place in society and assure us our livelihood. We were to reap not what we would sow, but what they had sown. I was particularly a slave to this conception of worth on account of my bearing our hero grandfather's name and of being told times without number that i was to be great not because of any particular merit of my own but because i was the direct representative of our revered ancestor i lived in that consciousness throughout my youth and sincerely believed that it would make a comfortable and worthy life possible for me on my arrival in the united states that idea was as powerful as ever with me However, it did not take me long to discover its utter inconsistency with the life of people here. They have no family trees of which to boast, no class distinctions to speak of, no nobility or caste of any kind, and they make no talk of ancestors, with the exception of a few who claim descendants from the Mayflower pilgrims. These last are publicly ridiculed for making such boasts, in my early residence here, I used often to boast of the fact that I was descended from such a line of people as ours. My listeners would look at me in a blank and uninterested manner, offering no comment or praise. This would annoy me, and I would say to myself, stupidy. 
but as i learned more and more of the simple unostentatiousness of american life i came to love it and i realized that it was after all the very highest attitude to take toward life they place a value here on a man's own worth and character be he the descendant of the humblest peasant or of the highest lord here poor men have the chance to and often do become rich here a person of the humblest birth like the immortal lincoln may even become president here a person of modest circumstances is intrinsically on a par with the rich here all men are equal at least they have an equal opportunity to get on in life according to their ability and ambition here people also emphasize progression in worth not what a man has been not even what he now is but what he aims to be this thought is characteristic of the best in america it was first brought to my attention very forcefully by two lines of lowell an american poet i saw them only once on a motto in a bookstore one day about five years after my arrival in america they bore such a contrast to my wanted mode of thought that though i have not seen them since that day i still remember them as if i had read them today these are the lines to change and change is life to move and not to rest not what we are but what we hope is best in those lines i saw then as i have seen more and more in the years that have followed what i consider one of the most outstanding characteristics of american thought life its mobility its spontaneity its freedom coupled with an ever-expanding life the foundation and the aim of which is real worth and not a consideration of what i have termed one's inherited worth this leads me to the next distinctly american characteristic of life which i have come to adopt as part of my philosophy and practice i refer to the practicability of american ways that my conception of life should have been idealistic in fact ultra idealistic might well have been expected for not only is the temperament of our people as of all the latin races one of idealism but i had as an individual been brought up perhaps more than the rest of you in our home in an atmosphere surcharged with idealism i need only to refer again to the ideal goal which grandmother had set before me and as you know father himself was so idealistic that he was continually finding it difficult to face the realities of life he lived so much in the realm of the ideal that with all his powers he died comparatively poor when I first reached this country, I busied myself so much with high and lofty ideals that I suffered considerably so far as the practical side of life was concerned. I was continually dreaming great dreams of what I was going to do some day, but I never busied myself with even beginning to do the great things or even with making practical plans as to how I was to actualize them. I made much of conditions. Some day, I would say to myself, when conditions become favorable, I will do this or that. The one thing which above all focused my attention upon the futility of looking at life in this way was an incident which took place while I was working in Boston. One day, we had a meeting of the committee of the institution of which I had charge i made a short talk in which i outlined the things i was planning to do as soon as conditions were right i thought i had made a splendid impression at the close of the meeting he whom i call my american big brother walked out with me as we were quite intimate with one another i naturally was expecting a compliment from him to my surprise however he turned on me rather sharply and said I am tired of hearing you talk about your dreams, of what you are going to do. Your ideals are all right, 
but what about the practical working out of them why don't you get down to brass tacks and tell us what you have already done i was dumbfounded and i confess it hurt me but from that day i began to observe life as i saw it around me in america i gradually came to the conviction that one of its outstanding characteristics is its practicability not the less idealistic but rather a practical idealism perhaps i have had a greater fight in striving to acquire this element of my american philosophy of life than any other i am profoundly grateful that i have been privileged to see the difference and to have had a chance to strive for its realization in my life to another friend i am indebted for my awakening along another line one day this friend and i were passing through a western city stopping at a hotel we went up to the desk to make reservation for the night the clerk informed us that the house was full in keeping with my latin temperament i immediately started to argue in the hope of making the clerk find us a room when my friend turned away in disgust and said i ask no favor of any man it hurt my pride i must confess all our teachings you know were to the contrary the entire environment of our childhood had taught us that the asking and granting of favors was a great part of life favoritism was the very essence of everyday conduct father taught us this proverb ask your way and you will find the road to rome it was the philosophy of dependence and i often wonder whether it may not be in part responsible for the lack of real independence and for the wide prevalence of mendicantism and pauperism in some european countries again i turned to american life as a field of observation soon i discovered that this was not merely a characteristic of my friend who had turned in disgust from me but a typical trait of american conduct then for the first time i began to see the absence of beggars from the streets then i began to note the way poverty and pauperism are frowned upon in this country then i learned that dependence in any walk of life is contrary to the highest form of thought and conduct in america for here self-reliance and independence are cardinal virtues above all these years in america have taught me the power and the value of optimism here again the contrast between the old and the new is very striking our tendency was toward somber pessimism our entire environment breathed forth that point of view perhaps it could not have been otherwise the death of one grandfather by poisoning and the other by drowning at sea was enough in itself to make the next and the next generation somber and sad mother looked down upon by her kinsfolk because of her humble birth led a saddened life father in his struggle against political corruption died almost broken-hearted feeling that his life and ideals were not sufficiently appreciated while in my own tossings about the world i had come to feel that this was anything but a gladsome existence nor was this the whole story the surroundings of our child world were destined to create pessimism in our thought we saw people burdened down by extreme poverty their backs bent beneath an intolerable load of taxes which reached down to the very last match they burned family after family was deprived of the earnings of their young men who were snatched away into continuous wars we saw many families all but torn asunder in this manner while the parent emigrated to some other country in search of bread for his brood which he could not earn at home added to this was the morbidness of our religious teachings when death entered a family the tears the mourning the doleful faces and somber black veils continued for years when adversity overtook a family or any member of it recourse was had not in seeking to recover losses or make readjustments 
but in tears, tears and more tears. Our people did not know what it was to consider the lilies of the field. Do you believe that a person can live in such an environment during the formative years without being affected by it, perhaps for life? I am sorry to say I had been greatly influenced by this mode of thought, and the fact that during the first years of my life in America I had accidentally lived in the midst of a certain restricted and narrow puritanical environment only added to my original pessimistic outlook. It was Browning who first penetrated my being with the rays of radiant optimism. It was he who taught me to greet the unseen with a cheer. The optimism of American life was first strikingly illustrated to me by the hilarious and exuberant cheering of men and women over a football game. What astounded me most was to see them cheer when their team was losing as well as when it was winning, as if to say, we will yet win, and as if thereby to overcome all obstacles to victory. It was the radiant joy, the bright hope back of that kind of cheering in life that appealed to me. When I first recognized that underlying optimism, everything seemed to say, the whole life is a game, a game fit for joy, for expression, gladsome expression. Here again Browning says, Oh, the wild joys of living, the leaping from rock to rock, the strong rending of boughs from the fir tree, the cool silver shock of a plunge in a pool's living water. How good is man's life, the mere living, how fit to employ all the heart and the soul and the senses forever in joy. All that these lines meant to me you can realize when you remember how again and again I had received a severe thrashing for leaping from rock to rock or for rending of boughs and for plunging in the sea's living water. In Italy I had been punished for the very thing that in America make up the beauty and the substance of life. The longer I live in America, the more I come to feel that optimism is vibrant in the very air we breathe. I find that people here have no patience with a pessimist human being. I hear people say, sure, this world is full of trouble, but say, ain't it fine today? I have been present at funerals where there was all the occasion in the world to weep indefinitely, but where I have seen exhibited the greatest of fortitude and optimism. I have seen people in America face all kinds of adversities with a spirit of superb courage. In peoples of the West, I have seen the positive workings of this optimism in a special way. It may be that it is due in no small measure to the grandeur, the sunshine, and the exuberance which God has showered in such abundance upon those vast and magnificent stretches. Whatever the reason, their optimism grips the very soul of me. I know a little woman in the West who, though she has borne endless pain and grief, still is the very embodiment of optimistic joy. I never think of her but that I think of Pipa Passes. I remember also meeting a man once on the prairies of Colorado who the night before had suffered a serious loss by fire, his barns, hay, and cattle, practically all he had in life. Knowing this as he drew near, I prepared myself to listen to his sad story and to offer my sympathy. To my surprise, he had no sad story to tell, and when asked about his loss by an interested relative of his who was accompanying me, he made some brief, carefree remark, and lighting his pipe, whipped his horse, and went on to the city to buy lumber to build more barns, singing and greeting the unseen as if nothing had happened. I would not say this kind of outlook on life does not exist elsewhere, but I have seen it lived in America 
as nowhere else on earth. These, in a general way, are the changes which have come over my thought life through years of residence in America. I hope I have satisfactorily answered your question. You may not think them worthy changes, but I can sincerely say that I am profoundly grateful to America and to the American people for them. I am grateful for having had the privilege of association with some real representative Americans and of rubbing shoulders with them and of absorbing something of their view of life. I am in a special way happy to have learned the English language and through its medium to have become acquainted with the stalwart thought of the master minds of the Anglo-Saxon race. Through it also I have come to know and in a measure to appreciate the sturdy and wholesome philosophy of the life of the American people. I am particularly grateful to those American men and women who by personal contact have brought me to this awakening. Did I say American men and women? Let us study a moment the persons to whom I have referred. The family which moved from Southern California to Maine and which so impressed me with the mobility of American life, was originally from England. The young lawyer was a French-Canadian. Tennyson, and his lest one good custom should corrupt the world, an Englishman. So was Browning, with his freedom from the shackles of others' opinions and his optimism. My American big brother and his brass tax philosophy is of Dutch descent, my friend of the I ask no favor of any man incident is a staunch Scotchman. The Pipa Passes referred to has a name that savors much of the fair Emerald Isle, and so on. The only one who taught me a great lesson and who might have been said to be natively extracted was Lowell. Doubtless it was not their fault that I did not receive more help from people who fall in this category. But the point I want to make is this, that after all, we all came over sometime. To me therein lies the great glory of America, that she can take the rough and unfinished material from many lands and climes, and so shape it as a master shapes his clay, that they who learn of her, who drink at the fountains of her real life, who learn to love her, actually become different beings. I take my hat off to the typical American, and I am profoundly grateful to have known him. Speaks he a slanted tongue, or a mellifluent and ever so pure a brogue, so long as he is the embodiment of the spirit of America, he is my man. He whose life is free to move about wherever the call is greatest, who is free from the thraldom of petty conventionalities and the nagging opinions of others, he who is idealistic and yet practical, who emphasizes worth above appearance and who greets the unseen with a buoyant cheer, he is my man, he is my American, he is the man whom I am glad to have known and the man whom I love with all the warmth of my southern soul. Your affectionate brother, Constantine. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Soul of an Immigrant by Constantine Panuncio. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Be it weakness, it deserves some praise. We love the play place of our early days. The scene is touching, and the heart is stone that feels not at that sight and feels at known. This fond attachment to the well known place, whence first we started into life's long race, maintains its hold with unfailing sway. We feel it even in age and our latest day. William Cowper. Chapter 19 Home Fifteen years had now passed since landing in this country. During all this time my people had never ceased to entreat me to return. 
and I had ever kept before me the dream of going back, at least for a brief visit. I had planned each year to do so, but never had enough money to make the trip. That I had worked faithfully and continuously, no one could question. Many times not eight or ten hours a day, but fourteen and sixteen, and I had even done night work in order to make both ends meet. I had driven myself so hard and so incessantly that vigor and health were fast slipping away. Again and again I was forced to count the pennies, wondering what further sacrifices I could possibly make that I might have just enough for a visit home. There were times when a longing for the sight of my people was almost unbearable. All that I had gone through in America would make itself felt with a tremendous accumulative power. I could again see my meager earnings being taken away from me. I could feel anew the bitter insults, the unfavorable discrimination, the ridicule, the prejudice. I could see again the prison walls within which I had been enclosed. I could experience again the pangs of hunger, the shivering cold, the hateful persecutions, the awful, terrible loneliness. My soul would almost cry out in madness for just a glimpse of those I loved and had lost a while. With a wide ocean lying between, and with no money with which to go and return to America, my dream of seeing my people again was fast vanishing and return to america i said for now i was of america sometimes i would wonder just how i would feel if i were suddenly placed among my relatives in italy would i after all feel at home even for a day would i want to remain in italy should the opportunity arise and enter some form of public life there I did not know. Then came the World War, and thoughts something like these ran through my mind. Suppose that Italy should side with one of the powers and America with another. Just where would I stand? Just where would my loyalty lie? The answer came in an unforeseen manner. One day I chanced to be in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Naturally, I went to visit Plymouth Rock with a group of friends. I was standing upon the rock when patriotic emotions which I had never experienced before gripped me, and a sudden revelation of all that America had stood for throughout its history and what it had meant to me dawned upon me in a forceful manner. With the least possibility of harm coming to America, it was borne in upon my consciousness what she now meant to me. America, in all her fullness, was the very life of me. Later, America entered the war. One evening I was walking through the common when I looked up, and there, high above my head, on the roof of one of the highest buildings facing the historical grounds, and shot through with a radiant light, I saw the stars and stripes, refulgent and glorious in her streaming. Again an inexplicable something gripped the very soul of me, and I worshipped as if at a shrine. Where would my loyalty lie? No answer. I have often wondered since then whether native-born Americans ever feel anything like what I felt on those two occasions. And it was that very vision that, by a series of unforeseen circumstances, was to lead me back to my native Italy. Even before America declared war, I offered myself to the government for military service. When enlistments began, I twice volunteered, in the hope that, notwithstanding my defective eye, I might get into the ranks before the authorities should become too particular. It was one of the most disappointing experiences of my life to be rejected. I still sought a possible way of serving this country in the war. Finally, as a last resort, 
I enlisted for service with the YMCA and went to France. I had been there about a month and a half when I was ordered to go to Italy with the first YMCA party, five in all, sent to that country. Headed by that man of magnificent spirit, Dr. John S. Nolan, formerly president of Lake Forest University, on January 3rd, 1918, we crossed the French-Italian border at Moudin. As the train slowly wound its way down into the valley, the cold, ugly fogs of northern France gave way to the radiant sunshine of Italy. The warm sun rays were flooding the plains below. The mountains, snow-capped, stood out clear-cut as diamonds, as if God had made them that very morning. Italy was wonderful, Italy of my childhood. A flood of emotion surged through my being, warm as the sun rays, pure as the summit snows. For a time, I closed my eyes. I could not bear the glory of the sight. At last, I was in my native Italy. Donizetti's famous lines and strains of music came to my mind. O oh, Italia, Italia, beloved, land of beauty, of sunlight and song, though afar from thy bright skies removed, still our fond hearts for thee ever long. It was my good fortune to visit my people soon after my arrival in Italy. There was an important errand to be done in connection with the American aviators who were then located at Foggia, and I was detailed to do it. Naturally, since I was so near, I seized the opportunity to visit my native town, which I had not seen for these many years. On my way from Naples to Foggia, while passing through that delightful country which Horace so beautifully painted centuries ago, I sat reading a book about that section of Italy and meditating. Into my compartment came a man with a valise who from his appearance I recognized as a latecomer from America. Seeing me in the American uniform, he at once opened a conversation in what he would have called English. He told me he had just returned from far off America, how many years he had been there, what a good country it was, how much money he had made, and so on. I do not know whether he thought I questioned his statements or that I did not understand his wretched English, but whatever the reason, he proceeded to furnish proofs of his long residence in America. First he showed me a dollar bill, much the worse for wear, then a watch, an Ingersoll, and a cheap chain. Finally, he opened his valise and showed me several presents which he was taking to his relatives, among others a much-prized Big Ben, which he was taking to his aged mother. We came to a small station, and the man left with profuse farewells. Into the compartment came a group of five beautiful Italian young women. They were carrying books, and from the conversation which I overheard, it was plain they were going to a larger village to attend high school. As they went on with their conversation, I once more took up my reading, occasionally overhearing snatches of what they were saying. Finally, I became conscious that their remarks were directed toward that nice young American who was reading all by himself and, of course, they thought, not understanding a word they were saying. One of the girls had a beautiful orange hanging from a long stem with four or five leaves on it. From its freshness, it was clear that the orange had just been plucked from a tree. Their conversation continued to center round that nice young American and his country, America. One of them said, wouldn't it be nice to go to America with him? To this all agreed. Gradually they began to joke with each other as to who would be the one to go. All this time, of course, I gave no indication that I understood a word they were saying. Finally, one suggested that the girl who had the orange should have the preference. 
and she was as beautiful a specimen of womanhood as Italy knows how to produce. They suggested that if she would only offer me her orange, I would surely take her to America with me. She blushed, and to ward off the attack, which was now centering upon her, she said, No, I won't give him the orange, even to go to America. But she added, Well, I might give him the stem and the leaves. This was more than I could resist. So, rising and walking up to her, I made my best bow and said in as good Italian as I could command, Thank you, gracious young lady, graciosa. I will take you to America for the stem and the leaves. The screams, the laughter, the blushes which followed can easily be imagined, but just then the train pulled into the station to which the young women were going, and they precipitously left the compartment pell-mell amid laughter and shouts which attracted the attention of all. I stood by the window and waved them a good-bye. The train wound its way down the mountainous path and was soon at Foggia. I did the errand which had brought me there, and soon was speeding toward my native Molfetta. I had, in the meantime, sent a telegram to Aunt Rose, stating that I would arrive on a certain train. The time consumed by that journey, from Foggia to Molfetta, seemed like ages. The train man came into my compartment to talk about America, but I led him to talk about that section of Italy. He told me of its history, its general contour, the location of the various cities and villages, not knowing that I knew all about it. Then he entered upon an account of the advance that Italy, and especially Puglia, had made in recent years, the opening up of new railroads, the making of double-track lines, the building of an aqueduct stretching for miles from the mountainous regions near Foggia through the whole length of the province, the building of electric plants, the industrial expansion of body, all of which was exceedingly interesting to me. At about nine o'clock in the evening, the conductor passed through the corridor and shouted, Molfetta! I took my suitcase and dismounted. No sooner had I left the train than I heard a voice in the distance shout, like an unexpected call of anguish in the night, Constantino! No one was on the platform. The police guard was keeping everyone back in the street. He scrutinized me in a special way examined my papers, and let me pass. I pressed through a number of people who were crowding around the gate, and the next moment I was in his arms. It was my good Uncle Carlo. Zio, uncle, I said, as he pressed me close to him and passed his hand gently over my face. It is eighteen years, almost to a day, since you saw me off at this very station. I thought I should never see you again. He took my suitcase from my hand and, locking his arm with mine, led me on, as if feeling a special paternal pride. We walked in almost complete silence. It was one of those moonlight nights of southern Italy, when the sky is so infinitely clear and the air so balmy as to make one forget that winter ever existed. The long, dark shadows of the low, flat buildings covered the narrow streets. The slender ash trees near the station and in the Via Garibaldi, which we passed, were standing like silent sentinels as of yore. In the distance I could see the Campanile rising above the cathedral. All was at peace. But all was changed. The shadows, the streets, the houses, the trees, the public buildings were all the same, and yet so changed. Why did they look so small? What are these? Are they the same houses which had towered so high above my head when a boy? Are these the same streets which had seemed so spacious and which had taken my little legs so long to traverse? Are these the same portoni which had seemed to my child eyes as gates to fairy castles? Are these the same trees 
which once had reached the very zenith of my childhood skies? Why are things so shrunken, so small? Is the molfetta of my boyhood days, after all, a toy thing? Such thoughts crowded one after another in rapid succession through my mind as I walked along by the side of Uncle Carlo. At last we reached the very house in which, with Grandmother, I had spent most of my childhood and boyhood days. At the door was Aunt Rose, quivering with emotion. She, more than all the others, had been the faithful one in writing to me, in keeping in touch with all my doings in far-away America, the one who had again and again pleaded with me to return, and had offered to send me the money to do so, if I only would. Now, in a moment, she gave vent to all the pent-up feelings of the years. The first words she uttered as her arms pressed me close and her warm kisses and warmer tears touched my face were, I thank thee, God, I have seen him. Now I am ready to die. In the next few moments she lived over all the years since we had seen each other. Much that followed is too sacred to narrate. I was thankful that I had arrived at night and so late that I had avoided the conspicuous attention which my uniform would have given me, and had escaped meeting the large group of friends and relatives all at once. That night I slept in the very bed in which I had lain as a boy, with the same old posts and the same quaint canopy covering it as of old. But now it was not quite long enough for my outstretched body. I slept, and I did not sleep. It seemed as if I could see my uncle going toward the balcony to fill my Santa Claus boot, as on that night long ago when I had first learned that Uncle Carlo was Santa, and I had loved him all the more. The next morning, long before I had risen, my little nephews and nieces, and it seemed their name was Legion, who had learned of my arrival, tiptoed into the room in which they thought I was asleep to view their long-lost uncle, of whom they had heard so much, and who had become the household saint of the whole family. One after another, they ran back to their parents with descriptions of him, how he looked, how long he was, that his feet almost stuck out from the foot of the bed, that he was almost bald, had no mustaches, and had a big nose. When the reports they had carried to their parents came back to me, I had all I could do to recognize myself. As soon as the long line of nephews and nieces had come to an end, even as I was having a moment to rise and dress, in began to file an equally long line of sisters, uncles, and aunts, and I even had to wash the shaving lather from my face to do duty by one of my sisters, Agatha, the jolliest of them all. In the meantime, that dear old aunt of mine, Aunt Rose, stood by with her bosom heaving, witnessing the whole proceeding like a sentinel, and taking a maternal pride in what was going on. I had hardly had time to dress when a banquet was ready for the distinguished guest. I wondered how they got so many relatives into so small a space. I was not surprised that they had sent all the children off to play. After the dinner party, my uncle took me out to see the town, and to show me off to it. We went to see my old nurse and the old shoemaker who had made all my shoes in my youth. We called upon some former pupils of my father, now grown men and established in business. I had now and then to accept a kiss on each cheek, which, strange to say, was not quite as pleasing to me as it should have been. I had been in America, where kisses are reserved for a special kind of creatures. We went to the Mole and the Harbor, both of which had seemed so enormous to me in my youth, but now were like little toy things. We passed through the Via Garibaldi, a small round patch as compared to its past splendors. 
the clock tower above the west gate had been torn down everything seemed to have shrunken to miniature size while my boyhood friends had grown to be men and some were gone the big city of my boyhood days was no more my relatives and friends asked all kinds of questions about america what the climate and the country were like what the living conditions were there was it true that money was in great abundance what were the chances of good employment they asked no questions about the government and the general life of the country i spoke of the good things but was too jealous of america to tell them all i knew of the life of the immigrant there or even to hint at some of the things that i myself had gone through they would have been shocked beyond expression to have learned that the son of don coli had suffered such things as i have narrated in the preceding pages when they asked my advice about their going to america i could not honestly counsel them to do so i was not unmindful of the practical misery in which most of the poorer classes live in italy but even misery is more easily endured in one's own country when i gave evasive answers or was silent in the face of their persistent questioning they were astonished they wondered why i would not remain in italy then i shrugged my shoulders italian style and passed to the next question that night i again returned to the home of my childhood and was glad that my relatives were considerate enough to leave me in the quiet of that home with my good aunt and uncle with them i renewed my play life we played hide and go seek as of old i played stealing almonds and figs as once i used to do in earnest i looked over all my little books and mementos closely guarded by aunt rose through the years i examined my little ships some of which hung on the walls i sat in uncle's lap and put on his nose those funny old glasses he used to wear when he would read to me those fascinating sea tales but through it all i was conscious and so were they that a great change had taken place deeper and more significant by far than any mere physical change there were changes in training in outlook in habits in motives which separated us forever aunt rose pleaded with me to promise that i would remain with her that at least i would remain in italy as long as she lived she told me that the tract of land and the casino on it which she had kept for me all these years was still mine and that i could have it for the mere staying and the mere taking she said that she would be so happy if i would only stay with her until she died only a few years more i remained silent though not unmoved comforting her with a word now and then i will come again aunt i said i will come again she understood i was no more of this fair clime no more End of chapter 19chapter 20 of the soul of an immigrant by constantine panuncio this librivox recording is in the public domain readers note in place of the usual poem chapter 20 begins with a piece of sheet music words by henry van dyke music by c austin miles oh it's home again and home again america for me i want a ship that's westward bound to plow the rolling sea to the blessed land of room enough beyond the ocean bars where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars chapter twenty my final choice the next morning i left molfetta and save for a visit of a few hours duration which i made later i returned to it no more in forty-eight hours i had passed from the peaceful scenes and the reminiscences of my childhood into the throbbing activities 
of the most bloody war in human history. It was while in the midst of these scenes and on my own native soil that my supreme choice was made. I was assigned the task of projecting the work of the Y at the Italian front, and by a series of strange circumstances I had the privilege of close contact with some of Italy's most eminent men, both in military and civil life, and was permitted to render to Italy, in the name of my adopted country, a distinct, even though a humble, service. At Mogliano Veneto, not far from Venice, was then located the headquarters of the famous Third Army. Under the command of the far-famed Duca d'Aosta, this army had accomplished a prodigious feat in checking the Austrian advance in the fall of 1917, and had thereby saved Italy from further invasion and ravage. As it was only about two months since the terrible defeat of Caporetto had taken place, the lines of the Italian forces were just beginning to take definite shape. Under the newly appointed commander-in-chief, General Diaz, a general work of reconstruction was going on. As the Third Army had suffered most severely in the recent retreat, we decided to begin our work with it and to do what we could to help the authorities build up the morale of the men. We therefore located our first headquarters near the command of the Third Army at Mogliano. It was my privilege, in an entirely unforeseen way, to raise the first stars and stripes, which, to my knowledge, ever flew near the lines of the Italian army. We had been at the front about a week when we realized the need of having our national colors flying above our headquarters. The only persons representing the United States who had up to this time made their way to the Italian front were a small group of ambulance drivers who had taken the famous poet's ambulances to the relief of the Italian forces. We inquired of them about a flag, but they did not have one themselves, so could not supply us with one. We made inquiries at several places. We sent to Venice, to Padua, to Milan, but from everywhere came the answer that no stars and stripes were to be found. It would take three or four weeks, we were told, to have one made. Finally, one day, I made it known to my fellow workers that since leaving the United States, I had carried, carefully folded against my heart, a small silk flag, about 18 by 24 inches in size. We decided that since we could not get any other for the present, we would raise this one, and we did. We had our little ceremony, and it was my privilege to put it out upon our balcony, where it remained until we had displaced it with a larger one. Later, I carried that little flag attached to my car to the remotest spots on the firing lines and even down into Sicily, in places where it had never been seen before, I was told, and may never be seen again. Wherever it went, it carried new hope and inspiration. And so it happened that it was given to an adopted American to unfurl the first American colors on the lines of its own native country during the Great War. It was given to me to perform a still greater duty, that of carrying to the discouraged soldiers of my native country, and later to the people in the remotest spots of the interior, the message of hope and encouragement from far off America. This, too, was purely an accident. On the first Sunday we were at the front, a new Italian Casa del Soldato, or Soldier's Hut, was to be opened. The famous priest and patriot, Padre Semeria, was to deliver the address. On the preceding Friday it was announced that on account of illness, Padre Semeria could not be present. Dr. Nolan, our chief for the whole of Italy, happened to be at the front when the news reached us and he casually suggested to the chaplain who was in charge of the opening that he should ask me to make a few remarks about America's participation in the war. So I was requested to speak at the opening of this first Casa del Soldato in the newly formed lines. I hesitated at first, 
chiefly because my practice in Italian public speaking had been somewhat limited, and I did not wish to mar the coming festivities by making a bad impression, or by failing to interpret in adequate terms the ideals and the aims of America's participation in the war. However, the request was so urgent that it seemed my duty to do the best I could. The casa to be opened was located close to the lines. These particular regiments of Bersaglieri, for whom the casa was being opened, were under the command of Colonel D'Ambrosi, one of the bravest and most quick-witted men in the entire Italian army. They had carried out their idealism to such a degree in beautifying an old house that they had made it into one of the most attractive spots imaginable. Around the grounds were flower beds, representing the various phases of Italy's participation in the war. They had succeeded most remarkably in turning an old and dilapidated house into an architectural and landscape gem. In front of the house, and camouflaged with leaves, they had erected a platform which was to serve as a rostrum in the coming festivities. The time for the opening came. The air was serene and balmy. The first signs of spring were beginning to appear, and the bersaglieri, always jovial, seemed to be in an especially good humor. The Italian soldier never forgets his mirth, even under the most untoward circumstances. They had gathered in great numbers, and were ready for the celebration to which they had eagerly looked forward. Our group of five American uniformed YMCA men arrived, and it would seem extravagant were I to tell of the wild enthusiasm that burst from that group of four or five thousand men. I was escorted to the platform, where General Croce was awaiting us. When the time came, I arose to speak. Here was I, a son of Italy, for many years in far-away America, now come back to my native country to bring words of encouragement and cheer. And here I stood before them, the first man they had seen in an American uniform, and speaking the first words they had heard of America's entrance and participation in the war. I spoke for about 15 minutes, in simple language, I enumerated the reasons why America had not entered the war before, and why she had entered on the side of the Allies now. I spoke of her unbounded resources in men and means. I told them how American soldiers had already landed on European soil, and that some of them would surely be sent to Italy. When I was through, wave after wave of uncontrolled enthusiasm burst from their throats. The air was vibrant with cheering. The enemy, not far distant, must surely have heard it. When I was through speaking, General Croce met me and, in keeping with the Italian custom, he kissed me on both cheeks, in token of deep friendship and appreciation. To me it seemed rather a strange performance, and looking round to my mates standing nearby, I smiled. They understood my embarrassment. The general then insisted that a picture be taken of him and myself, and another of the entire group of generals and other officers present, including our YMCA men. These pictures were sent to the interior and published widely throughout Italy. Then a reception was tendered in the casa to all the officers present. So far as I was concerned, the incident was ended. To my surprise, however, the following day a messenger arrived from Army Headquarters requesting me to present myself that afternoon for a conference regarding an important matter with General Giuseppe Vaccari, Chief of Staff under the Duca d'Aosta. I went to the beautiful villa in which the command was housed and was ushered into the presence of the General. General Vaccari is a man of unusual dignity and poise, yet withal one of the most kindly men as I came to know afterwards. As I came into his presence, every bone and fiber of me stood erect. I did not know or even suspect what I was wanted for. 
after exchanging the usual greetings, he spoke of the reasons why he had called me to him. He said, His Excellency, the Duca d'Aosta, has requested me to thank you most heartily for the service you rendered us yesterday at the opening of the casa. We heard of the speech you made, and of the enthusiasm and encouragement which it evoked in our soldiery. He further instructs me to state that he would like to have you, at the expense of the Italian army, to continue to render such a service by going from place to place as may be directed later, addressing the soldiers along the lines. I answered that it was my duty and privilege to render any little service I could, and that, subject to the approval of my superiors, I should be happy to place myself at the commandant's disposal, and to do what I could in the name of my country to serve the Italian soldier. With that, we parted. From that day until I left Italy seven months later, when I came to America to bring a message from Italy, I was in the midst of incessant activity. Repeatedly I was called, early in the morning or late in the evening, to mount a car waiting at the door and go to some spot on the lines to speak in the name of my adopted country. On one occasion, it was my privilege to speak to 12 battalions of Ciclisti, the famous bicyclist sharpshooters. On another, to nine battalions of the equally famous Mitraglieri di Sardinia. One evening, just as the sun was setting, I faced a large body of men under the command of General Angelo Santo, a daring Neapolitan soldier, and as soon as the address was over, they marched into the lines not far away. On still another occasion, on a hillside, on whose crest the enemy was deeply entrenched, I addressed five thousand men who, at the close of the meeting, marched to their places in the trenches on the hill. And so the days passed, days of continuous activity, through which I was serving my native country in the name of my adopted country. Later, at the instance of the military authorities and of the United States Committee on Public Information in Italy, I made a complete speaking tour of Sicily, reaching even the remotest hill towns inland. Sicily was at that time in a very low state of morale, yet it rose to the occasion, and the unbounded enthusiasm of the people was manifested by the thronged theaters and other public buildings, and in the surging crowds that gathered in the open squares to hear of America. I carried with me small ribbon American flags and distributed them by the thousands, especially to children who had relatives in the American Expeditionary Forces. Those were the months of throbbing activity and of unequaled opportunity to observe the people and the life of my native Italy. I had occasion to confer personally with scores of the highest officers of the army, from the Duca di Osta to the generals in command of the various armies and army corps, and with minor officers. I came into personal contact with many civilian officers and with leaders in the educational world of Italy. I had the privilege of escorting some leading American citizens and prominent men of other nationalities to the front lines, to interpret in some important conferences, and to carry between certain Italian and American authorities military information of the greatest importance. Above all, I had an unexcelled opportunity to observe the life and the institutions of my mother country with the eyes of manhood and in a way I never had before. I was given access to some of the most beautiful and cultured homes of Italy. I had the privilege of viewing the matchless natural beauties of Italy and of drinking in the invigorating sweetness of Italy's skies, rivers, lakes and seas. Opportunities were open for me to enter public life in my native country and to contribute to it what I had gained of experience and outlook in my adopted country. At times I almost entertained the thought of remaining in my native country, 
but something not entirely in the realm of reason or in that of patriotic sentiment kept tugging at my heart pulling like a magnet toward america one day the final choice took place it came in the midst of the splendor of a military occasion and unseen by human eyes i myself did not realize its fullest significance at the time at messina where i was to address a regiment of nineteen eighteen recruits i was met by the venerable general lang who took me to the summit of the hill overlooking the straits of messina it was late in the afternoon turning toward sunset as we reached our destination on the very summit of the hill lined up in military array in the form of an open square some five thousand young soldiers were awaiting our arrival sighting our car officers and men came to attention while the band wafted out on the breeze the martial strains of the inno nazionale the italian national hymn we exchanged the usual military salutes and then in a few simple words i spoke while speaking my eyes were fixed upon the matchless sight before me in the distance beyond the strait was Scylla. there too was my native country italy below slumbering peacefully in the sunset glow was messina with her mole arm stretching out into the sea the crystal blue of the mediterranean was vying with the delicate tints now rosy now purple of the western sky subconsciously i was thinking of the italy of the ancients and of the italy i had known before my eyes the two national standards each exemplifying so much were waving triumphantly in the stiff breeze sweeping over the mountain crest one stood for italy both ancient and modern which the world respects for the italy of my childhood for all the memories of my youth of loved ones for all that had been beautiful and lovely in my boyhood for the tender memories of loved ones living and dead the other stood for all the suffering of the years for the awakening of manhood for the birth of freedom for the unfolding of life i loved not one the less but the other more the address over we exchanged greetings with the officers in charge of the occasion and returned to our car then followed a scene which will forever remain indelibly imprinted upon my memory and consciousness the soldiers even before being ordered to do so spontaneously broke ranks and made a mad dash toward the road where our car was waiting wave upon wave of evive l'america swelled they massed themselves along both sides of the road as our car began to move slowly down the serpentine way the standards were still waving triumphantly the band was now playing the star-spangled banner we moved on the sun was just going down into the sea the waves of cheers followed us growing fainter and fainter like an echo we gradually lost sight of the soldiers their uniforms blending with the earth but still we could see a mass of white in the distance the boys with their handkerchiefs were waving the last possible farewell the last in viva to america all was now silent save for the thud thud of the engine as our car moved slowly down the hill general lang and i uttered not a word finally he broke the silence his eyes were dim memorabile he said as he looked back just then the sun sent forth its last ray looking back the only thing i could see was the stars and stripes waving gloriously in the last radiant beam of light i looked toward the west and in my soul i said through the western window comes the light i knew where my heart lay an hour later i was on a northbound train and two weeks after that 
I was on my way to America. I called upon several of the civilian and military authorities to pay my respects, chief among whom was the Duca de Osta. He spoke deep and appreciative words of what America had done for Italy during her most trying hours, and requested me to repeat in America his appreciation whenever I had opportunity. At last, I was on my way toward my adopted country. I was conscious that something vital had taken place in my life. The final and lasting choice had come, and I knew it. Through my mind kept running the lines of Dr. Van Dyke. It's home again, home again, America for me. Years before, by a series of strange circumstances, I had been tossed upon the shores of America. Now I turned my steps by definite choice toward that country of which sages dreamed, America. On September 28th, 1918, 16 years almost to a day from the time when I first set foot on American soil, the U.S. transport Croonland anchored in New York Harbor. As on the day when I had first sighted America, so now she, the Queen of the West, was again decked in festal array. It was the morning when the Victory Loan campaign was launched. The forts thundered their salutes. New York, the great city of the Western Hemisphere, was resplendent in one glorious canopy of matchless colors. I was again in America. I felt like kissing the ground as Columbus had done centuries ago. And yet a feeling of loneliness again came over me. Strange as it may seem, I felt as of old that I was alone. Had it not been for my American big brother, whose voice over the telephone dispelled some of that feeling, I might have felt like a man without a country. Nor was this feeling without foundation in a measure. Soon after my return, I was asked to take up work in the Middle West. A letter was shown from the man to whom I had been asked to report, saying he did not see how he could use a foreigner with such an outlandish name. On my way west, a group of young men passed through the coach and taking me for a Jew, began to shout, Sheeny, Sheeny, how is business on Salem Street? Of course, within me, I laughed heartily, and yet such incidents give one a feeling that no matter how much he is at heart an American, he is still different and will forever remain so. I have now been in America for 19 years. I have grown up here as much as any man can. I have had my education here. I have become a citizen. I have given all I had of youthful zeal and energy in serving my adopted country. I have come to love America as I do my very life, perhaps more, and yet they still call me a foreigner. Not that I mind it. No, no, for I believe that with a real American, a man is a man, though he comes from the ends of the earth. I do mind it, though, for the numberless men and women who do not know how to take it philosophically and humorously as I do, and who pass through life in this country under that ugly shadow ever hanging over their heads of being despised foreigners all their days. As for me, I care not, though my features may always show something of my origin, of which I am far from being ashamed, though at times my speech may betray my foreign birth, though I should suffer unendingly, though thy son should ever dub me a foreigner, still I love thee, America. I am not blind to thy failings, but thy virtue and thy glory far outshine them. Whatever betide, 
I am thine, and I claim thee as mine own. In my veins runs blood, in my mind run thoughts, in my soul feelings and aspirations which thou hast given me, thy name is graven on my soul. I love thee, Italy, my native land, with that mystic love with which men turn to their native country, and as pilgrims to their shrine. I love thee, America, with manhood's strong love, born out of the unfolding of the mind, the evolving of the soul, the sufferings and joys, the toil and the larger loves of the years. I love thy very life. I love thee as I can love no other land. No other skies are so fair as thine. No rugged mountains or fruitful plains so majestic and divine. I am of thee. Thou art mine. Upon thy sacred soil shall I live. There I fain would die. An American. End of chapter 20 End of The Soul of an Immigrant by Constantine Panuncio Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson